Rationalism, Johann Herbart, History of Psychology, Psych 182, Department of Psychology, California State University, Fresno, Professor Michael Botwin. Johann Friedrich Herbart's my favorite rational philosopher. He had a psychology that was mechanical and mathematical. He believed that the activities of the mind could be expressed in mathematical terms. You'll find this happening many times in the history of psychology. And it happens again when we, for example, get into field theory with Kurt Levine and other theories in the 1900s. He believed that psychology, though, could not be a science if it's the study of the mind, because the mind is unitary and can't be broken into pieces. So, despite the fact that he doesn't consider his ideas psychology, I think they still fit with the notion of many of the things we think about today, except that we can't fractionalize the mind into small bits and pieces. Now, he believed ideas varied on three dimensions. Time, including memory and things like that intensity of the idea, and the quality of the idea. These are things that we've seen over and over again in rationalist philosophy. Now, Herbart developed something that he calls psychic mechanics. And although I'm not a Freudian, I, as a personality psychologist, are fairly well versed in Freudian theory. And I believe that Freud uh, let's be kind and say borrowed many of his ideas about the psyche from Herbart. Herbart believed that ideas have a force or energy all their own. If you were to look at later analytical and psychoanalytic theories, you're going to find psychic energy is the most important component of those theories. And he believed that ideas have the ability or power to attract and repel each other as they attempt to enter consciousness. Uh, similar ideas can form together in a larger idea or a larger uh, set of psychic energy, to use the Freudian terms, and eventually enter consciousness. Now, just as Freud said, we never forget anything, Herbart says, an idea may be conscious or unconscious, but it is never forgotten. He also believed that ideas come from experience, but then take on a life of their own. And you see that with many notions that are come to come later in our ideas about psychology. So, ideas can become things like the Jungian complex. In Freud, they might, Freudian theory, they might be different kinds of anxieties that you may have about things or other notions. So, he really is the forerunner of many of these notions. Now, he had an idea about uh, what enters consciousness, but he calls this the apperceptive mass. And he says that compatible ideas gather together in consciousness and form together a group of ideas that constitutes what he calls the apperceptive mass. Once the compatible ideas gather enough force together, they may enter consciousness. Uh, I like to think of this by analogy as ideas, kind of like magnets, they either attract or repel each other. Herbart says ideas can also be in competition with one another. You can have some kind of conflicting ideas. Uh, for example, uh, to use a very serious example, uh, child children that are victims of child abuse often have the notion that you're supposed to love your parents but you hate them because they're hurting you. So you have notions like this. How can you have love-hate relationships, for example? 
ideas can bond together and mobilize their energy to keep other ideas out of consciousness. Now you can see this is clearly the forerunner of repression in Freudian theory and other kinds of defense mechanisms. If similar ideas are rejected, eventually they can come together and displace the apperceptive mass with a new set of ideas and enter consciousness. So with Herbert, you see this constant fighting between ideas attracting and repelling each other or trying to move to be recognized in the conscious mind. Now, while all this is going on, Herbert also developed some ideas. He called them transcendental principles. And these are categories of the mind that are independent of sensory experience. In other words, again, the component of the active mind that's so important to our rationalist philosophers. So, for example, events follow other events according to rules. Every event has a cause, and nature is a series of causal relationships in Herbart's philosophy. Furthermore, without causality, there's no way to order the universe. And he believes that causality is not learned from experience, but we do know it intuitively. We just understand it because it's a component of our mind and it's how our mind deals with information. He says that experiences are filtered through these concepts in the mind and become more meaningful units. If you can categorize a unit, you can understand it better. You can see the influence of Immanuel Kant on this way of thinking. Now, the categories of thought that, not excuse me, uh, Herbar talks about uh, are many, here are a few of them, unity, reality, totality, negation, you've seen some of these before, possible versus impossible, cause and effect, existence or non-existence. We understand these without experiencing them. For example, we can understand the unity of everybody coming together around a common cause. Uh, for example, patriotism, or to go back to old stories, the Knights of the Round Table are all in unity for the good of Britain and to support Arthur. That's fiction, no naturally. Herbart goes on and says that space and time are knowable without experience. We understand these concepts. They're just there in our mind. For example, he uses the idea that we cannot understand the notion of all through an experience. You can play that little kid's name. We can talk about having all of something, and then you can always add one more. So we can understand the concept of all, but we can't experience all. Now, in terms of how we understand things, Herbart says a person is not born with ideas, but with the way that you organize those ideas and that information, and that in turn gives us the possibility of having experiences. Furthermore, the mind is not a substance, but a formal unity, and it organizes the world for the individual in time and space. In other words, like Kant, we have the notion of the mind as being an abstract thing. Now, just to confuse you, uh, we have another view of apperception that Herbart gives us, and that is the idea that the mind processes and assimilates new experiences and gives them meaning. 
we apperceive or we perceive something when we have a meaningful context for our experiences. So Herbart's pulling together all of these different rationalist thinkers and synthesizing the ideas. A lot of Kant here, but you can see how he presages many other ideas about how consciousness works. So, it's the end of our discussion of another rationalist philosopher. I hope that you've learned a bit here, and we'll see you next time in the history of psychology. Bye now. This has been a We Have Couches video production. Copyright 2020, Professor Michael Botwin. All